so nice to be here. I'm very grateful you're here. And by the way, this is not only about the kids, our children, the students, it's about ourselves, believe it or not. The next 10 to 20 years, uh, we're going to be experiencing changes definitely at a much faster rate than the past 10 to 20. And if you thought that the past 10 to 20 were already dizzying, well, attach your seatbelt. But first, congratulations, Australia. You are the happiest. According to the OECD, the Better Life Index, you are absolutely number one. Celebrate. <laughs> and so how are we going to proceed so that this remains the case facing a number of challenges, right? You all recognize these challenges. And technology is going to be adding to all this. Technology is really the oil on the fire. Technology is an accelerant. It's an accelerant of good things and bad things. Now let's talk about artificial intelligence. You know, it's being applied everywhere. All of a sudden, the investment has absolutely exploded, and we have all the giants of technology and a ton of startups all investing in all sorts of areas of artificial intelligence where it can have impact, like uh, video recognition and text-to-speech and so on and so forth. 3D printing. You've all seen 3D printing with cute blue bunnies in resin and so on. Yeah. But now there are titanium parts that are flying on aircraft at a much lower cost. You can even design and build organs. I mean, prosthetics, as in this case, but soon kidneys and livers. This was compiled by the World Economic Forum, 10 jobs that didn't exist a decade ago. And you recognize a lot of them, you know, drone pilots. No one would have told me 10 years ago we'd have drone pilots. And yes, the robots will be displacing workers serving hamburgers. So for that dream job that you had in mind, I'm sorry, but you may have to revise your, your hopes. And yes, the cartoonists are having a field day. So we have a new world we're all facing. It's a new world that is qualified by futurists. They use this acronym VUCA. VUCA stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. And I think we all recognize that this is the world we're in now. It's this race between technology and education that's taking place. It's what happened with the Industrial Revolution. Technology zoomed ahead. And now with the Digital Revolution, we have the same situation occurring. Technology is zooming ahead of where education has been. And the disturbing part is that when technology is ahead, we find ourselves in situations of social pain. When te technology has, when education catches up with technology, we have prosperity. We are facing social unrest. We're starting to see it. So what are we to become? in a world where we lose our jobs and are not helped to retrain fast enough? Fair questions. Which means that we have to anticipate. Anticipate, move forward ahead of the problem. And that's why not changing is actually more dangerous. We have this inner propensity as humans to resist change. Change is uncomfortable for all of us, I suspect. But not changing is actually more dangerous. And that's what I'm going to try to show you throughout this presentation. In the meantime, we've all been this little kid saying, why do I need to know this? That's why we pay attention to something. Tell me that it's relevant for my life. And students and employers alike realize a lot better than educators that there's uh, something amiss here, right? By a factor of two, educators think, uh, let's say, more highly of themselves than, than their customers. So what do you think? What do, you, what do we need, what do our children need to be successful in a world that's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous? What do you think? I'm sorry? Resilience. Resilience, thank you, beautiful. Adaptability, Adaptability yes. Empathy. Critical thinking, thank you. I'm sorry? Creativity, yes, absolutely. 
I'm sorry? Community, thank you. Problem solving. Global perspective. Hope, thank you. Risk taking. Curiosity. Optimism. Money. Money. <laughs> well, I noticed that none of you talked about, I don't know, more trigonometry. <laughs> you all talked about character qualities, you talked about skills. You already realize from your activities on a daily basis that what you know is not sufficient. It's also how you use what you know, your skills, how you behave and engage in the world, your character, and how you keep on learning how to learn, how to reflect and adapt. So, what's holding us back? A number of things. University entrance requirements that reflect the past in a very narrow view of what measures our capabilities going to university. What's holding us back are assessments that are, again, very narrow, grade-centric, about very traditional things, not measuring the entire individual and its capabilities. I'm not saying that assessments don't matter. I'm saying they have to be done the right way for the right parameters. And then politics. You know, that's, uh, in a sense, uh, the, the strength and the bane of democracies. New broom, everything goes. We're starting all over. You know, no one says, well, what you've done was correct, and I'm going to build on it. No, no, everything just goes out the window. We start all over again. And then there's bias. All of us have bias. That's normal. That's part of being human. But experts that are asked to think about new standards of education always consider that what they know is more important than anything else. They're not looking at the richness of even their own discipline. They're defending, let's say, geometry, or even worse, trigonometry, <laughs> as if we needed as many woodworkers and land surveyors as we did 100 years ago. And I'm not picking on mathematics only. Every single discipline has the same bias, being very, very narrow. So, in the end, it's a question of fear, right? We fear change, and we're paralyzing ourselves, and we're living with this caterpillar without realizing that it has in it the same DNA that makes it fly. And we're just paralyzing ourselves with fear, and we have to transcend it. So, what's happening, of course, is that we're all getting frustrated. The students are saying, hey, what gives? I know this is not preparing me well. We have parents. Parents that say, yeah, I'm kind of confused. I'm not recognizing the world. I'm not recognizing some of my, what my, my child is learning. Is that the right way? Um, these projects, that sounds a bit goofy to me. You know, why not just drill like I was drilled? Hmm. And then the teachers, they're not trained to new methods, and the requirements that are imposed on them come from the top, and they're not allowed to change them. And so we sometimes bark at the wrong tree by blaming the teachers for their inability to change. And the policymakers and the administrators have been burned. They tried a few things timidly, and they've been burned, and they've recoiled. So it's a question of versatility. In the end, we're talking about the 21st century that's moving constantly and forcing us to think through, you know, what is the toolkit we can assemble very early on and continue building on through our life so that whatever life throws our way, we know how to react and we are equipped to react. Except that we have a couple of problems to fix. Minor ones, mind you. <laughs> Only two things, what we teach and how we teach it. Sounds simple. So let's start with the what. First of all, let's really clean up. You know, let's go through everything we have on the docket and see what's relevant for today's time. I'll give you the, the example of trigonometry as a quip. 
In reality, every single discipline is full of old things that don't matter. They're there just because they've been there since the Greeks or whatever. We really have to go back and clean seriously to figure out what matters in this age so we can make room to bring in new disciplines, the ones that should be part of the curriculum, like personal finance or robotics or wellness or entrepreneurship, things that actually matter more than ever. And then embed in that themes that are relevant to the world today. Uh, one of you mentioned uh, understanding other cultures. Well, that's global literacy. How about fake news, right? Distinguishing between good and bad information. That seems to me like an essential skill. And on and on, obviously, digital literacy, etc. How about learning skills to use that knowledge so that the knowledge doesn't remain inert? So the four C's of creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. We use this constantly. And our character, right? how we behave and engage in the world. These are the six essential qualities from which you can recompose the 200 words or so that people throw around when it comes to this topic. We've realized it's not just what I know, it's not just how I use what I know, it's how I act, how I am. And lastly, something that's truly at a premium, this ability to continue learning with a can-do attitude, the growth mindset, as it's called, and this metacognitive ability, this ability to reflect and adapt constantly, watch ourselves in action. The trick here is also to make it deliberate and comprehensive and systematic and demonstrable. Very often we have school systems or really good teachers that do some of these things, but they do it sometimes for some kids in some instances. Our ask, our need, is to make this systematic and demonstrable throughout the system. So, here comes the hard question. What do we remove? Mind you, it's perfectly possible to remove things that are extraneous, if we use a scalpel, not a chainsaw. Just remove the right bits, the ones that no longer matter as much, or never matter, perhaps, without destroying the whole edifice. So, let's talk about the how, and conclude soon. We've known for centuries that it's a question of awakening a passion of students. We've known for centuries that we learn best when we do, it's not sufficient to only hear or even see. We have to do to truly understand. So it means that as we redesign the how of education, not just the what, which is the first cornerstone, the second cornerstone is to rethink the how. And that means personalizing the learning. That is the holy grail. We've invented mass schooling with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, now we have to invent mass personalization, which doesn't mean that there's not a common trunk that's needed for everyone so that we can have language that we all share in our conversations, be they political or healthcare or otherwise. But there's also how you learn that will be tailored to you a lot better. And that also means learning by doing with collaborative projects. Now, a lot of us have experience of very shoddy, very poorly run projects that have really been a joke, quite honestly. That's not what we're talking about. You are trying really hard to design these projects so that you learn, that you're collaborating, so that the students rotate through the various assignments, that, they're really, that, that there's really deep learning going on, and not simply goofing off because it's a cool project. No, well-targeted, well-run projects. That's what it's about. So what can you do? You can love. You can model. And very importantly, you can guide. What you've heard today, I wish actually your kids, the kids you care about, our students could have heard it. 
Because every time I have presentations in front of students, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. What took so long? They get it. But what they don't know is what it takes to get there. And this is where they need your wisdom, your guidance, your enlightened wisdom, your enlightened guidance. They need it. They need it more than any, at any other time because the world has become so much more complex. We cannot count on a 10-year-old to figure out what's needed. They see the tension. Help them explain it. Help them find their passion and get involved. This organization all here is very unique in the world, and I really recommend you get involved. Go straight to their website and start helping. You all have your part to do wherever you are. Yes, it seems complicated, it seems impossible, and then all of a sudden, it unlocks. But it's only going to unlock if all of us work on it. It's not going to happen by magic. It's going to take hard work. And really, I have a lot of faith in Australia. Australia is a country of pioneers. Pioneers have a different spirit. They try harder, they dare take risks, and I really think that you will. <laughs> so, yes, it's going to require bravery. It doesn't come easy. This kind of change, this massive change, is not going to come easy. We're all doing this for a better world. It's satisfying for us, it's satisfying for the planet, it's satisfying for the future of humanity itself. Thank you very much.